flashbacks. Okay, as I was saying in the other video, there are no rules, and if you want to use flashbacks, use flashbacks. However, I've seen a lot of them um, in student work that are really badly used, and which actually have the effect of losing the reader. I'm going to make a generalisation about modern readers, which you can argue with, but I think I've been reading a lot of old fiction for the project I'm doing, and the way you could get away with writing 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, is not a way that will endear you to children today. Because I think they are looking for a reason to put the book down. If they're not engaged, they'll put the book down. And when I'm writing myself, my constant fear is that I'm being boring. And to be honest, I often am. So then you have to make it less boring. And one way of making things less boring is actually not to put in more action or more activity or to make it busier. But in a way, it's to get closer to the emotional heart of your story, to stay with your main character and be with that character as they endure or experience the story unfold. Now, that works well in real time, if you like, so that you, you're with, okay, you don't have them go to bed and get up every morning, it's tedious, but you stay in the moment, what I call the story moment, for all the major events. Whenever you stop, to um, insert a, a chunk of description or if you want to or you take the person away from the moment of the story to into the past you risk losing your reader either because it's confusing or because it's not as interesting as what was going on in the moment so if you are going to insert something from the past in more than a sentence or so be really really careful that you want to do that because you lose the tension that you've built up, the interest you built up with the reader in the events that are actually going on. So can I give you an example? Um, she lifted her flashlight and um, inspected the wall in front of her. As far as she could see, there was, there was no break in it. It was firm and solid and as strong as any wall could be. It reminded her a little of the wall in her grandmother's house when she'd been four and struggled to get through it. How she'd struggled beating her small fingers and small palms against the wall, screaming for a grandmother. That same sense of fear engulfed her now. Now in a way, <laughs> sorry I just made that up as you can tell, um, but you know the moving away from the moment in the wall is a, is a real problem and this is a genuine connection between those experiences. Um, and just be really careful because it's not really about what you're allowed to do, it's what your reader will tolerate. And if you imagine, I mean, these are my readers, I don't really imagine the reader at all, but it sometimes helps to think that the reader is your own self as a very impatient child. So I imagine myself as a very impatient 10 year old and it's like, oh, come on, come on, move it, move it, move it. Oh, this isn't interesting. That's the kind of thing you have to imagine. And you write to that reader so that at any point where you start losing attention or you disappear at one, you know, you, you, you need to take it back into what's actually the story because it is the story. The, the relationship between your protagonist and the events around them and the other people that is what is gripping, not really the backstory. So drip that in very carefully. I'll do another thing about that in a second.